Hi everyone, this is part two of a series where I'm responding to Andrew Kaufman's interview with Kate Shamarani about the coronavirus pandemic. So if you didn't see part one yet, I'll put some links on the screen and in the description, and that would probably be the most logical place to start. So we only made it about five minutes through Andrew's interview in part one, but let's pick up where we left off last time. And Andrew's talking about the claim, reported in the scientific literature, that genetic material from viruses was detected in samples taken from the lungs of sick patients. One more point before we let Andrew get started, it's worth mentioning that in this interview with Kate, when Andrew mentions coronavirus research, he's mostly referring to a single article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So a lot of the points that I make will also refer back to that paper. The really only thing that they they did do, which um, and they made kind of a big deal about this in the paper, is that they took some genetic sequences out of this lung fluid. But the thing is, the lung fluid has so many different constituents in it that have genetic material, right? Like there are human cells of varying kinds, lung cells, immune cells. There's bacteria and fungal cells, all the normal uh, microorganisms that live in our body. And so how do you know where this genetic material comes from? So the first point here, and I mentioned this last time, is that the researchers didn't look at all of the genetic material. They only sequenced the RNA, not the DNA. And that can really narrow down what we're looking at. Further to that, we already know the entire sequence of the human genome, so we don't need to worry about picking up human genetic material from lung cells, which is one of the concerns that Andrew mentioned here. And to be honest, it's a rather silly point to make. Prior to this study, various groups have already looked at the lung microbiome with similar large-scale sequencing efforts, and various articles have described what kind of microorganisms you might expect to find in human lungs. And in the New England Journal of Medicine article, the researchers didn't just sequence the lung fluid of the patients with the unknown pneumonia, they also acquired control samples from patients with pneumonia caused by a known pathogen. So when Andrew says there's a lot of genetic material here, that may well be true, but it's wrong to characterize this as some kind of crap shoot. The researchers were well equipped to spot something unusual, which is exactly what they found here. They picked up a 30,000 base pair RNA molecule. This doesn't tally with anything bacterial, and we're not left with much space for maneuver in terms of understanding what this might be, because these kind of large RNA molecules are unusual in cellular biology, but commonplace in virology. And that's even before we start looking at the sequence. And another thing to point out here is the abundance. So they took 20,000 reads from individual specimens. Now that's not exactly easy to place into context without some more information, but it's certainly not a small number of reads. So Andrew's asking questions here that he thinks are rather smart. And when he asks how are we supposed to know where that genetic material comes from, he doesn't think there's a good answer. But in fact, there is, providing you have a strong grasp of cell biology. And like I said, that's even before we start looking at the sequence, which is what we'll get on to next. So let's cut back to Andrew. Right. So they basically just, um, uh, you know, seem to take these probes that they pre-identified as being viral in origin. And they use these to pick out strands that matched. And then they said, ha, this is the evidence of a virus. Now, in regards to this comment about probes, I've tried a few times to decipher exactly what Andrew's referring to here. I think he might have been talking about the fact that researchers used a PCR to amplify viral sequences. And if that is a criticism he's trying to raise, it's not really a valid one because they also used an unbiased high throughput technique, which didn't require any probes or primers or any foreknowledge of the sequence that they amplified. But what I actually think he's referring to here is the use of bioinformatics. So here's what Andrew says exactly. So they basically just seem to take these probes that they pre-identified as being viral in origin and they used these to pick out strands that match. And then they said, ha, this is the evidence of a virus. So this doesn't match the description of the methods of any paper that I'm aware of, and I think Andrew has this kind of backwards as usual. But let's talk about bioinformatics. It's a science that's chiefly concerned with the collection and comparison of biological data, and probably most importantly comparing nucleotide and protein sequences. So rather than try to decipher exactly what Andrew's talking about here, let's just do the bioinformatics because it's actually quite straightforward. First, the researchers sequenced the 30,000 base pair RNA molecule. That means that they used an instrument to read what order the four letters of the genetic code appeared in. 
This molecule was abundantly present in these patients with a pneumonia of unknown origin, but not in the control samples. And obviously that stuck out to them. That's why they sequenced the lung fluid after all to see if there was anything unusual. So having found this sequence, they would have wanted to know, well, does it match anything we've seen before? So then they would have queried that sequence to a database of existing nucleotide sequences, which uses an algorithm to find the best match. So let's just go to NCBI and copy the sequence that the researchers reported, and we can paste that sequence into a tool that searches the entire NCBI nucleotide collection for the best matches. Now, of course, when we do that today, we see very close alignments to all of the recently deposited COVID-19 genomes. But if we set the maximum sequence identity and sequence coverage to, let's say, 95%, which will exclude all of these recent additions, the closest match we get is bat SARS-like coronavirus isolate COVZ-C45. The sequence identity is 89%, which means that about 9 out of every 10 bases or letters of the genetic code match between these sequences. And that's the same isolate that the researchers noted in the New England Journal of Medicine paper. Now what you'll notice is that I didn't start with any viral sequence or pick out any strands that match. We just asked the database which sequence was the best match, and that included bacteria and human and fungal sequences. And it turns out that the best match to that RNA molecule found in these patients is a coronavirus, a bat coronavirus. So look, if you don't like that conclusion because you think the sequence was made up in the first place, that's fine, just leave the conversation. There's no point arguing about this stuff if you don't believe that the sequence reported was actually found in these patients. But Andrew isn't questioning that. He specifically disputed the methods used to match this RNA read to other viral genomes. And he's factually incorrect. You don't have to pick out any strands. The bat coronavirus was the best match available at the time, hands down. And look, if that's not what Andrew was talking about, and he wasn't talking about PCR, then I haven't got a bloody clue. If he wants people to understand him, he should use either clear language or at least the correct technical jargon of the relevant field. If anyone wants to enlighten me in the comments, that would be wonderful. But let's just pause here because I want to address another question that I'm anticipating. And I think people will ask, well, how do we know that the sequences in the database are actually from viruses? So the really quick answer here is that viral genomes have been sequenced directly from purified infectious particles. In fact, before PCR, that was basically the only way to do it. The very first genome of any kind ever sequenced was an RNA virus way back in 1976, using some pretty challenging looking experimental techniques and relying on some interesting properties of RNA confirmation. More recently, researchers don't always need to purify viruses to get a readout of the genome before depositing it in the NCBI database because we already know the genomic structure of lots of different types of virus. And providing that there's sufficient sequence similarity, it's easy to identify new viral genomes and distinguish them from, say, a bacterial genome. I think something analogous that people are probably more comfortable with is the analysis of DNA at crime scenes. When police take a DNA sample from a dead body, for example, there could be loads of genetic material on that swab from plants, bacteria, viruses, fungal cells, maybe even other animals. But that doesn't preclude us from identifying the human DNA and even matching it to a specific person. And that's because we already know the human genome, which was carefully mapped in the absence of any contaminating genetic material multiple times. Now, I think I'm going to have to loop back to some of these points later on, but I wanted to cover it quickly here, but let's get back to Andrew. And then they, they did something really strange uh, to go further is that they um, compared it to uh, another virus that was the one responsible for SARS in 2003 or so they say. Or so they say. Well, obviously the way Andrew's talking here is extremely irritating. But apart from that, is it strange to compare the sequence of COVID-19 to SARS? No. The best match for COVID-19 was that bat coronavirus, but we don't know much of anything about it. What we do know a lot about, on the other hand, is SARS. There are thousands of research papers and the virus has been extensively studied and characterized because it infects and kills humans. So when researchers found this new coronavirus, it's just a natural point of comparison. They would have been eager to know if this new virus had any points of striking similarity to what they're already familiar with. Perhaps if the structural proteins are similar, a drug in development for SARS might also work for COVID-19. Equally, if there's an unusual or important difference in the sequence, that might be a good place to focus research on. So this sequence comparison, far from being strange, is obvious and necessary 
necessary. And this is something Andrew would be familiar with if he was a virology researcher. Now, I'm not sure to what extent the public or perhaps Andrew are aware, but serious researchers read and write the genetic code. These strings of letters are a meaningful language and sequence comparisons are part of how you interpret it. And they said that because it was almost 80% identical in the sequence to that SARS-CoV-1, that, it, that it's related. But I looked up uh, some more information about this because I had remembered that we have very close uh, sequence in our genetic material to chimpanzees. So I wanted to you know, see how close they are. And so it turns out that we are 96% similar to chimpanzees. Right, and that's pretty close, only a 4% difference. But they're saying these two viruses are related uh, by 20% difference, right? So a 4% difference, we have totally different species of animals, and then here they're saying a 20% difference means it's the same kind of virus. So let's think about what Andrew said there. He said that humans are a totally different species of animal to chimpanzees. Well, is that a fair way of characterizing our relationship to chimps? No, they're literally our closest living relative. So sure, they're a different species of animal, but they're not a totally different species of animal. They're a very similar species of animal. Really, I think Andrew's overestimating just how different we are to chimps. The differences might look pronounced to us because we're humans, but to an alien biologist, we might look almost indistinguishable. So the novel coronavirus is about as closely related to the original SARS virus as we are to, say, a cow, if we want to go on percentage identity, which is around 80%. And in the grand scheme of biology, we're still pretty closely related to cows as well. After all, we're both mammals with a very similar body plan and almost all of the same organs. COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 was described as similar to the original SARS virus because it is, but it was also described as novel because it's that too. And look, when it comes to using sequence identity to determine how similar species are, these kind of comparisons based on percentages aren't very informative when you compare across viruses and mammals. And Andrew pretty much stumbled into that when he was talking there. So a 4% difference, we have totally different species of animals, and then here they're saying a 20% difference means it's the same kind of virus. A coronavirus genome is about 30,000 base pairs, the human genome is 3 billion base pairs, so how many nucleotide differences are there between the SARS virus and SARS-CoV-2? About 6,000. How many base pairs are different between the human and chimpanzee genome? 120 million. So this angle of Andrews to me isn't very compelling. Species aren't delineated based on sequence similarity similarity alone, and comparing percentage differences of genomes that are vastly different in size, structure, and content isn't all that informative. And just to link back to the sequence comparison we looked at earlier, regardless of the percentage identity and quibbling over human and chimpanzee DNA, this novel RNA sequence identified in these patients is most closely related to other coronaviruses. Whether you want to characterize that as a close relative or a distant cousin is something of a moot point, because if you want to reference this genome to something, which is a good idea, you have to start with coronaviruses. <laughs> So it's almost everything about this research was extremely suspect. And there's absolutely no conclusive evidence that there's even a virus at all that they isolated from any of these patients. So now we get about 10 minutes into his interview and Andrew says a couple of interesting things. Firstly, he says that almost everything about this research was extremely suspect. And it's worth pointing out here that it's extremely suspect to Andrew. And I think that's really a reflection on Andrew. So far, he's failed to understand the meaning of the word isolate in virology. He's ineptly summarized cell culture experiments. He's repeatedly ignored the role of the control group when interpreting experimental data. And he's complained about the lack of microscope pictures of the virus when they've been clearly presented. And he's obviously being confused by the role and significance of sequence comparisons in biology. And so it doesn't really surprise me that Andrew thinks the research is suspect. He just hasn't understood it. Then Andrew says that there's absolutely no conclusive evidence that there's even a virus at all that they've isolated from any of these patients. And it's a slippery word, isn't it? Conclusive. It just means that there's no evidence that convinced Andrew. But so far, all Andrew's done is demonstrate that he doesn't understand the evidence, and now he says that he doesn't believe it. Imagine my shock. Wow. So, so coming on to that, um, I heard one of your talks, and it, and it resonated with me because... Um, when I did the Gerson therapy, 
the the whole the whole foundation of it is you're going to detox the body and replenish the body so as i started to do all the juices and take the supplements and do the coffee enemas i ended up with rashes and blisters and cold sores and uh, and and of course in latin virus is poison and so you talked about how the exosomes come out of the cell they kind of soak up the toxins which is what i've been saying and then they, they've got a little lock on them and they head off down to some cells. They take all the toxins away from the cell before it breaches that cell wall. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because, wow, have I been slammed for that one. Well, Kate never misses an opportunity to talk about herself, does she? And to be honest, I can never watch a video of her where she doesn't mention the five coffee enemas a day, and I'm kind of sick of the image of her pumping coffee where it doesn't belong. But what's Kate talking about here? Well, firstly, of course, animal cells, rather famously, don't have a cell wall. That's a biology fact right up there with mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. Anyway, Kate's introduced this idea of exosomes removing toxins from cells, and we might as well wait for Andrew to expand on that. But first, we need to endure a little more of his wisdom on word origins. So, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm you're absolutely some right. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, it's I think it's really, really telling actually about the meanings of the words. <coughs> Excuse me. <Swap> so, <laughs> virus, virus does come from uh, from the Latin meaning poison, and it even was used to describe, I think, snake venom. Uh, back then. So, and I think really what, what we're seeing with these, all these illnesses that they call viral illnesses is that they're really caused by toxins. Well, Andrew's got something right here at last, the origin of the word virus, which is apparently Latin for poison. But personally, I don't think you can compute any significant scientific insights from word origins. It's a kind of mystical conspiracy game people like Andrew and Kate like to play. I mean, the word avocado apparently comes from the Aztec word for testicle, but that doesn't mean it has a similar composition or flavor. Maybe they just kind of look similar. When it comes to viruses, well, they make you sick, like toxins do, so that's where the name comes from. But that's about as far as this kind of analysis can get you. What I think is very telling is that Andrew believes that all viral illnesses are caused by toxins, and here he's ignoring centuries of careful investigation and observations that are contrary to this hypothesis. It's kind of hard to know where to start here. I guess the key observations would be that viruses can make you sick in the absence of any known toxic substances and unlike an exposure to something toxic viral disease can be somewhat dose independent one viral particle can be enough to make someone just as sick as a million that's not how toxic substances work though where the dose is generally speaking proportional to the sickness it causes and since viruses self-replicate one infected person can make many more people sick in a pattern that just doesn't comport with the spread of some kind of poison or toxin. The classical animal experiments involving isolation of viruses would involve serial passage of a virus from one host into another with each animal or batch of animals developing the same symptoms and this kind of thing wouldn't work with a toxic substance which would get diluted out over time. Of course, it's true that some toxins or poisons can cause the same symptoms as viruses, like, say, a raised temperature, but that's only because there's a limited number of ways that sickness can manifest itself in the human body. I'm not going to devote another whole section of this video to the history of virology. I actually kind of did that in the first video. But what I really want to focus on here is some of the more specific scientific claims that Andrew's going to make in the rest of the talk, because I think that would be a far more productive use of time. And so I had this idea about exosomes, which uh, was really interesting. And how does it play into this whole uh, scenario? So exosomes, as you mentioned uh, correctly, they're little vesicles or like sacs of fluid that look exactly like uh, what they tell us viruses look like under the microscope. Wait, what exactly do they tell us viruses look like again? Well, actually, viruses have a great diversity of sizes and shapes. Even though it may be true that some viral particles resemble exosomes because they're small and round, there are actually lots of different kinds of viruses that look very different. And this is a pretty shocking blunder from a supposed expert, because I think most people are aware that viruses come in different shapes and sizes, but we'll come back to this later. So carry on, Andrew, what were you saying about exosomes? And it's something that all of the cells in our body make. In fact, all mammalian cells make this and probably plant cells as well. So it's very common. And we put these things out at a base rate all the time. 
No, so Andrew's wrong again here. Just a quick check in the literature, and I found this paper titled Induction of Exosome Release in Primary B Cells Stimulated via CD40 and the IL4 Receptor. In the conclusion, the authors wrote, Importantly, our results show that predictions of exosome release from resting primary cell types cannot always be determined from studies of their malignant or immortal counterparts, such as B cell lines. Furthermore, this work is in agreement with a recent report showing that resting B cells require activation for exosome release. Together, these findings emphasize that cell-to-cell signaling is an essential mechanism of exosome synthesis in primary cells. Now, it seems that this is an active area of research, and it may be true that most cells produce exosomes, but it's not settled science to say that all cell types have a base rate of exosome biogenesis, but let's get back to Andrew. But when we're exposed to a toxin or we have an acute illness, and it could be almost anything, like even ionizing radiation, it could be psychological stress, uh, it could be pneumonia, asthma, it could be uh, various poisons uh, like uh, pesticides or heavy metals or antibiotics, that our bodies uh, put out more exosomes, and this is called like induction of exosomes. And the exosomes uh, generally are thought most, most likely to have a communication function, that they basically communicate information that's contained in the genetic um, uh, material to other cells in other parts of your body, and maybe even to other organisms outside of your body. Okay, so all of this might well be true. Exosomes are probably involved in cell-to-cell communication, and they were previously thought to have some kind of role in exporting toxins from cells. Personally, I've never heard of exosomes as a means to communicate with organisms outside of your body. This seems pretty far-fetched to me, although I'd be curious to see where this idea came from. But we need to let Andrew make some progress here, because he's ever so gradually making his way to what I suppose is his main point or big idea but they have like specific receptors that target them to a certain type of cell and then they uh, arrive at that cell and give the information. But they've also been shown that they can actually uh, eat up toxins outside the cells. So a cell would excrete them and in the presence of toxins, like there was a great experiment done where there were bacterial ex- endotoxins that would uh, be to- kill the cells basically. And when, the cell, when they mix cells with exosomes with the bacterial endotoxins, the, the exosomes gobble them up and the cells survived. When they mix other cells that didn't, weren't expressing exosomes, those cell di- cells died. So this suggests that um, exosomes have a sort of detoxification role. So the fact that exosomes were apparently able to rescue cells from endotoxins might be more of a property of lipid vesicles in general rather than any specific function of exosomes. But without Andrew giving any details of this paper, it's pretty hard to follow what he's talking about. Regarding the true function of exosomes, most recent reviews have focused on a communication role. And it's my personal opinion that when a single biological structure or molecule is assigned several different potential roles in cell biology, that's an indication that there's more to understand. This review on exosome biogenesis and release says that finding consensus in the field is complicated by methodological challenges such as the use of different methods for exosome isolation and quantification and I think these difficulties apply to the field of exosomes as a whole. A scholar search for role of exosomes reveals a plethora of literature on cancer, stroke, bowel disease, and mental disorders, but all this discussion of exosomes isn't all that informative in a conversation about COVID-19, because exosomes aren't viruses. But let's carry on with the interview, because I think Andrew is about to introduce his big theory. So this suggests that um, exosomes have a sort of detoxification role in our body, which would make sense that they would be involved in these illnesses that they tell us are viral illnesses because they're really uh, due to toxins and the exosomes would be part of the healing process. But where I thought this was really came into play is, um, remember I described the experiments before where they mix these foreign uh, cell cultures with antibiotics. Now, antibiotics have been shown experimentally to induce exosomes in several studies. So they basically made a recipe to make exosomes from these foreign cells. So it would be very easy to just uh, snap a picture of that under the microscope and say that it's a virus. Okay, so this is essentially the crux of Andrew's argument. He thinks that researchers have confused exosomes, which are being produced in response to toxins, for viruses, which Andrew thinks don't actually exist. 
So here's why he's wrong. Firstly, you can distinguish viral particles from exosomes, especially when so many viruses look nothing like exosomes. I mean, viruses infect bacterial cells which don't even make exosomes. When it comes to SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses, they do have a similar size and shape to exosomes. That's because they're both small membrane-bound vesicles. But you can still tell them apart. The viral particles have dark spots on the interior. I'd recommend viewers to these correspondences regarding exactly this issue published in The Lancet and a couple of kidney journals recently. And here the authors refute supposed claims of coronavirus electron microscope pictures and they point out that knowledge of virus morphology and morphogenesis as well as of cellular architecture is necessary to distinguish viral pathogens from normal subcellular organelles. That second point about cellular architecture is important because even though both exosomes and viral particles might sometimes look just like circles, coronavirus particles are produced in distinctive subcellular compartments which don't look like the multivesicular bodies that exosomes are produced in. And if you really want to look at this subject in detail, I'd recommend this paper, A Unifying Structural and Functional Model of the Coronavirus Replication Organelle Tracking Down RNA Synthesis. This paper has some great images and really shows the detail of the importance structures. But I don't want to get too hung up on spot the difference on these unlabeled electron microscope pictures. In fact, the CDC recommends that viral inclusions should be confirmed by immune electron microscopy that specifically labels viral antigens, that is proteins not encoded by the human genome, or by using in situ hybridization. And this technique specifically highlights viral genetic material, that is genetic material not encoded in the human genome. And these kind of techniques are good because they're specific but they require specialized reagents. It's kind of irritating for Andrew to introduce this as his idea because scientists are very much aware of the difficulty of distinguishing certain subcellular structures from viruses. So what we actually have here is Andrew's ill-informed take on an ongoing scientific discussion. Apart from the sniping in the literature regarding COVID-19 and kidney cells, the closing paragraph to modern uses of electron microscopy for detection of viruses lists lots of examples of subcellular structures that can be confused for viruses. So no one really needed... Andrew's input here, the weaknesses of electron microscopy are enthusiastically discussed by the people who take the images. But if it's possible to confuse viruses with parts of cells, why aren't scientists more concerned? Well, that's because virology is not just about looking at microscope pictures. We could put all the microscopes in the bin and still come to the same conclusions. In fact, viruses were studied long before they were ever imaged. The first electron microscope images were produced after 1939, but viruses were known to exist before this, and there was plenty of interesting and insightful research. So electron microscope and other images are useful, but they're just one of the tools used in virology. Andrew also brought up antibiotics a few times here saying they were a recipe to produce exosomes and it's a bit of a self-contradictory point to make. Just moments ago Andrew said that he thinks all cells produce exosomes all the time so according to his own logic scientists would be able to snap a picture of exosomes whether or not they added antibiotics. But I'm guessing his thoughts probably track back to this 2017 report, Antibiotic-Induced Release of Small Extracellular Vesicles with Surface-Associated DNA. And the researchers in this paper only looked at one kind of antibiotic, though, so maybe they could have titled their paper Ciprofloxacin-Induced Release of Exosomes. And there are lots of different types of antibiotics, though, and they have different mechanisms, and not all of them induce exosome production. In fact, the paper I mentioned earlier where researchers showed that B cells do not constitutively produce exosomes. They use penicillin and streptomycin in the media and these didn't induce exosome production. And these are the same antibiotics used in the New England Journal of Medicine article. So it may be true that some antibiotics induce exosome production, but that's not true of all antibiotics and all cell types. That is to say, Andrew's concern about antibiotics being used to induce exosome production somehow confusing scientists isn't really internally consistent because he thinks all cells produce exosomes all the time anyway and it's not really scientifically sound either because we're not discussing the same antibiotics or the same cell types. Okay so that's enough for this video and I'll consider continuing with a part three to this series if this video gets enough views or if enough people ask for it. I haven't really enjoyed making this series though and it takes an awful lot of effort to respond to complete interviews like this. I've given it my best shot but this isn't perfect. I'm not sure I've always picked up on exactly what Andrew meant and we've covered a lot of ground in terms of the science so please let me know in the comments and I'll pin any genuine corrections. 
Obviously, if you've watched up to here, then I would really appreciate it if you like the video and subscribe to my channel. As far as I'm aware, comments are probably the best way to boost a video's ranking. So if you want this video to appear in search results, go ahead and tell me that you like my new plant because I'm pretty pleased with it. Or you could just tell me I haven't made my bed properly again. Also, I'd really appreciate it if you shared the video with the kind of people who might actually benefit from watching it. It's one of those ironic things about making skeptical YouTube videos is that most of my viewers probably agree with me anyway. Oh, and don't forget to like my Facebook and Twitter pages, and I always like getting messages on those as well, even if it's just hate mail. 